Tonight, it is my great pleasure to welcome Graham Beal to lead off this series. Graham Beal has served as director, president, and CEO of the Detroit Institute of Arts since 1999. Since joining the DIA, he's overseen two major capital campaigns and guided a complete renovation of the DIA's 1927 building, rationalizing its floor plan and bringing it up to current professional standards. The final component of the renovation was an innovative reinstallation of the permanent collection that has attracted international attention. Most recently, in a fantastic display of community support, Director Beale successfully campaigned for the passing of a millage, which put the DIA on secure financial footing for the first time in decades. It's truly a remarkable thing. Director Beale was born in Stratford-on-Avon and grew up near Hastings on the south coast of England. He has degrees in English and Art History from the University of Manchester and from the Cartauld Institute of History of Art at the University of London. Director Beale has worked in the museum world for 40 years in a number of institutions in both the United Kingdom and the United States. Uh, and for the sake of brevity, I will not list them all, but I will mention his time as chief curator of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art from 1984 to 89, his tenure as director of the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha, Nebraska from 1989 to 96, and his tenure as director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art from 96 to 1999. Fortunately for the DIA and for all of us here in Michigan, in 1999, Director Beale left Los Angeles to take up his current position. Director Beale has organized over 40 exhibitions, many of which have toured nationally. His publications include books on the American artist, Jim Dine, on contemporary British sculpture, and on the DIA's American art collections. He has served on numerous national and international panels, including uh, those for the National Endowment of the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities, the Federal Advisory Committee on International Exhibitions, and from, um, and from, 2003, from 2002 to 2005, he was a trustee of the, of the Associ Association of Art Museum Directors and chair of its Arts Issues Committee. Tonight's lecture focuses on the changing meanings of perhaps the most iconic object in the DIA's collection, Diego Rivero's Detroit Industry mur Murals, From Eyesore and Epiphany to Elegance and Elegy. Please join me in welcoming Director Graham Beale to the University of Michigan. Thank you. I'm glad you did that. Good evening. Um, a few years ago, uh, my, my daughter, uh, without asking for any advice, um, decided she was going to go to London and get a graduate degree in art history, um, which she did. And when I was over there on a business trip, uh, she asked me, in, in London, she asked me if I would be willing to talk to her class. And I said, well, yes, I, I would, I said, but having seen the kind of courses that they were offering, at the university, I said, uh, you, you must, be, might, must be prepared, perhaps, to endure a little bit of opposition and maybe even embarrassment. And she said, why is that? And I said, well, I'm old-fashioned. I believe in things. You are being taught theory. And it's that, that there's been that tremendous gap, um, uh, and it, it, a tremendous division, uh, whereby individuals who did believe in things uh, tended to be accused of privileging um, objects, and it, it's been gratifying for me to see over the past few years that gap being narrowed, not to the advantage or disadvantage of, of either one, but seeing these two things uh, come to, together. I, I do uh, passionately uh, believe in things. I'm a failed painter. That's how I first in, engaged, uh, engaged with art. Um, and so that, th this, is, this is the kind of thing that brings me uh, to, my, uh, to my desk um, uh, ev every day. Um, the DIA, uh, here you see the opening of the, the 1927 building. When it opened, um, it was something of a uh, revolution. Uh, this slide is taken from the 1929 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, where it is used as an example of the ideal modern art museum. 
It was revolutionary to uh, some degree in the States because uh, rather than following the French method of showing uh, art by medium, sculpture in one gallery, paintings in another, tapestries in another, that kind of thing, it actually took the, the viewer on a walk through culture. You start here with the Egypt, Greece, come all the way around here, all the way up to uh, modern uh, European, uh, modern European art. Same for America on the other side with temporary exhibitions in the middle. That's now all the American wing. Um, and then the rest of the world uh, packed into this uh, suite of galleries, uh, suite of galleries here. Um, but it was a very clear, very leg legible building. And when you, you, you came in the, the main entrance down here into the great entrance hall and into the main hall, you progress through the main hall, um, and uh, as you can see, glimpse through the Yellen gates there um, into the garden court, which is what this looked like um, in, uh, in when it opened in 1927. Um, the paintings on the, on the walls here, that's a Pendergast, and this is an Augustus John um, a painting, were basically bought as holding pieces because it was always the plan um, of the architect Paul Cray, as well as uh, the director William Valentina, to ha have these walls for murals. And obviously, there was a, a kind of assumption, certainly in the architect Paul Cray's mind, that this would be some Arcadian or bucolic uh, kind of uh, a kind of scene. But as we all know, that is not what happened. Um, there, oh, there you see, I love this slide because there in the full blast of the sunlight is our Burne Jones tapestry, which we hardly ever put up at all these days. Um, but here's Valentina with his patron Ansel Ford. Uh, he was in California in the summer of uh, 1931. Um, and he met Rivera, who was painting this mural um, in San Francisco. Uh, allegorical kind of thing, sort of symbolic. It's all, all about um, industry and, and, and agriculture. Um, but uh, a single, well, the, the piece above, but basically a single mural that has people and things that symbolize what's great about, uh, about California. And that presumably um, is what um, Valentina had something like that in mind when he asked uh, Rivera if he would be interested in doing a mural um, in the new uh, DIA. Rivera was in the country at the time uh, because of his retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, it's more credible now than it was 40 years ago, but the first, uh, the first uh, single artist retrospective at MoMA uh, was that of, of Matisse, and the second one was of Diego Rivera. That was the, the high regard that he was held in um, at, at that time second only to, uh, to Matisse, or Picasso presumably coming a little bit later. Um, Rivera said yes, he came to, um, to Detroit in um, April 32, uh, went to the new, as it was then, Rouge plant, and spent a couple of months uh, making sketches and making photographs. This is the kind of sketch in the sketchbooks that he made there. This is the kind of photograph that he took because he was very concerned about, uh, about getting things right, and with one exception, insisted that all of the equipment that will, would be seen in the two murals uh, would be um, up to date and, and not uh, um, obsolete. Um, here he is uh, with Mrs. Ford, um, uh, an, an English lord, and his wife, Frida, of course, the Lord Hastings, um, Frida Kahlo, and an unknown uh, gentleman. Frida hated it um, in Detroit. She went to New York as frequently as she could. Here she is uh, painting in the um, uh, in what was then the hotel across the road uh, from the DIA. She also had the great disaster of her miscarriage when she was here in, in Detroit, the painting the Henry, Henry Ford um, Hospital. But Rivera uh, went to work. He took sketches like this with the photographs. And I think you can see from the framework, there's these big uh, pylons here with the beams going across, that that is what this basically became. This is the, the presentation drawing that he uh, made to uh, Edsel Ford at, after dinner one night at the Edsel Ford um, house. Um, and you can see from this that although there are differences um, in the, many of the details um, of the finished work, the south wall of the museum where the Burne Jones had been hanging. Um, there are differences in the, in the predella, um, uh, programmatic differences, and, and differences in, in, in detail. 
But uh, when Edsel Ford became demonstrably excited by this whole project, somehow, and history is not clear on this, Rivera was able to produce drawings for work for a scheme that would cover the whole, all of the panels um, in, the, in the gallery, in, 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 in the court. Um, and right there and then, Edsel Ford and Rivera negotiated a deal, and it was a deal. Rivera got a much bigger canvas to work with, but Edsel Ford got a reduced price on R R Rivera's customary $100 a square foot. Um, and this is what it would have looked like This uh, had they just stuck uh, with the commission. And it would clearly, I don't have, this is in the North Wall, I didn't, didn't get um, uh, the, the, ask the photographer to do one of those as well. But you can see, as an experience, it would be very much looking at this one over here, and then turning and looking at the other one, or being able to stand back and, and, and sort of see, see both. But what Rivera gave instead uh, with the final work was a, a much more, uh, this is what it would have been looked like. You'd start with the making of the, of the, uh, the steel up here, then winding its way through, um, through the, the, the the, 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 work, the conveyor line down here working on the blocks and moving over here so the cars are being assembled, are being brought down here and then finally being this, the body being put together uh, with, the, uh, with the chassis um, and then finally uh, going, out, um, of the, uh, going out of the museum. Um, and the, the, this slide, even at this scale, is so inadequate I can't actually pick out the only complete car in the whole mural, which is a little car sideways uh, painted red, which had to be uh, a, a comment by the communist uh, Rivera. What he gave instead, however, was this kind of experience. Even looking at one of the walls, it, it sort of it overwhelms you, it sort of leans over you in a way that the, the single panel uh, did not. And he moved from telling the story of building a car um, and the, 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 the men who did it, um, uh, to putting together components that talk about uh, the, a, a number of dualities, the old and the new, um, the, the good and the bad, the organic, the in, inorganic, um, the, the, the yeah, again, it, organic, inorganic, the rocks against nature, man against, uh, against nature, um, identifying what he identified as four, the four races, um, and um, uh, gave an, f for for one person to do this is quite remarkable. At this time, when you if you were planning murals um, uh, in most countries, you would hire someone to write a program for you, in, in a sort of Renaissance um, uh, way. But Rivera, as far as we know, developed this whole thing in all its complexity entirely by himself. And here is the, the South Wall uh, with the other the other two races, and you can see the. On the previous wall, we had the hands coming up there with the rocks, the, the same kind of thing uh, here on, on the south wall. Um, here is uh, the, the, just quickly the people who Rivera worked with. He did all the painting, but he had a number of assistants who, who came to, um, to Detroit specifically to work uh, with him. He, he um, the museum paid for his fee and all the, the materials, and some of the materials were very expensive, like lapis lazuli. R Rivera was uh, responsible for paying his assistants, and one way that he did that was by not paying his assistants, who had to learn to find ways to trade drawings for dental bills and food, until one of them, Halberstadt, who was the main skillful plasterer, threatened to go on strike outside the museum with a placard saying, Rivera, unfair to labor. And Rivera, <laughs> Rivera gave in. But one of the people who was also working on the mule said, didn't speak to Halberstadt for six weeks. And there is, the, whoops, there of course is Diego with, in the characteristic position of his arm around someone else's wife. <laughs> um, here we see him working, uh, pa painting the whole thing himself. I put, juxtaposed these two pieces together so you, you can see uh, the way that he was working. And here they are, uh, just about to get ready for the opening. There's Rivera looking quite smart down in the corner. There are c contradictory reports of, uh, or accounts 
some of which say that the mural was kept absolutely secret, no one was allowed to go in there, and that the controversy when it was afterwards exploded, that doesn't seem to have been the case. They seem to have let people in. I have a, a, a now quite aged trustee who, when he was a little boy, his mother was a Spanish teacher, she took him into the court and he shook the hand of Diego Rivera, who was in there actually painting uh, the mural. So the evidence is that people were coming, seeing what was, what was going on uh, quite a bit. So uh, as you walk into, as you walk, fr oh, that's what I was doing. Wrong way. As you, as you walk in now from, from the Great Hall, this is what you see as you walk in. The, the fetus, the source of life that's embedded in a uterus, the, 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 the veins of which have both organic and inorganic uh, feel uh, to them, it's got sort of a universal um, uh, uh, message with these very um, uh, luscious looking, uh, individuals here with the fruits um, of the earth. And then if you turned around, you would see the other end of the wall, everything to do with, uh, with what well, for this purpose of this lecture called man. Um, not only that, you have, whereas you had nothing but good on the natural side here, you have uh, war on one side and peace on the other with the dove um, and the eagle. And then you also have uh, a, 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 a grisaille relief showing rubber going from what was then Malaysia uh, coming over to the city of Detroit uh, to be, um, that is the skyline of Detroit at that time. And, and the, the example of the kind of the old and the new and the mix of the cultures here, uh, Rivera um, uh, portraying the Mexican life death uh, mask, building it into the um, in, into the program, ref referencing ancient America through his own Mexican tradition. And also referencing uh, Mexican tradition, uh, this pressing machine was actually obsolete. There was one in the factory when this painting was being made where this whole thing was sheathed and, and you couldn't see any of the workings inside. But here, Rivera is using it. This is the god um, of war and creation. Um, and um, you could see how he's mimicked it with this great stamping machine with these individuals down here uh, with uh, um, the hair being stood on end by the force of the air coming down for the stamping machine. And there is Rivera and, and uh, Ford Renaissance patrons in the corner. Um, he brought together dualities of individuals. Uh, this, the American engineer, is a composite portrait of Thomas Edison and Henry Ford, who were the best of friends. Some individuals think that, the, that, that Rivera distorted this dynamo form uh, to make it look more like a human ear, because Ford constantly spied on his employees, sent squads of people around to make sure there was no alcohol in anyone's home, that kind of thing, um, uh, chastised wives who weren't keeping the house uh, clean enough. Um, in the American engineer, uh, the, the American worker is an idealized combination of Rivera himself and an idealized American worker. Uh, he got away with lovely little things like this, the red star on the glove, communism. Actually, there was at that time a company in Detroit called the Red Star Glove Company. So he got these nice little, these clever little jabs built, built into it. And he himself can be found in solidarity with workers being poisoned by the processes, the very processes of making car there in, 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 the, uh, in, in the, the derby hat. And so th that is the whole thing. It's complex. Uh, it has all sorts of things going on backwards and forwards across the, the planes, but not only across the planes, the planes also across the room. Uh, the, um, just so get the right slides here. If, if, this is actually looking at the, uh, at, at the south wall, but if you were looking at the north wall, uh, you would see you would see this painting on one end and this panel on the other end. In other words, putting together the good and the not so good of modern chemistry. But then if you look at that panel there, of that top corner of, the, of that wall, and then look across the room over the embryo, uh, you will see this uh, piece here where you see technology and medicine being used uh, for the good of mankind, similarly on the, on the, uh, at the other end of the, of the panel. So you have not only have all of these messages mixing in a one, a one among, uh, mixing together, you actually have sort of phys uh, physical connections that you have to move through to, to, uh, uh, to, to be able to, to make them. 
And then he made the Gradella. The Gradella turned from being a series of vignettes about aspects of car building to a day in the life of a worker, starting with um, the workers clocking in in the morning and um, uh, getting them leaving in the afternoon. Uh, talk about the change in meaning. In, in this time, people looking at this mural in the early 30s would have understood completely that these were cars that had been made by these people, all this abundance out here. I've actually heard tour guides say, and here are the workers going off at the end of the day to their cars to go home. <laughs> so, you know, it was, wasn't quite like that. In fact, and this, this is the, the, the bridge, the overpass in which the disastrous, murderous events happened a few years uh, later in the, in the labor, labor strife. And in the middle of the predella, little jokes like this. Here is Henry Ford teaching. Um, the, the engine has been turned into a, a dog. Um, the, feet, the feet here refer to the fact that one of the reasons the auto industry was established in Detroit was because Michigan was a great center for making uh, wood stoves. And so those are the, the paws that you see on stoves. These apprentices here being taught uh, look simian uh, because they were known as monkeys. And they thought that anybody uh, stupid enough to want to work on the assembly line must be, uh, must be um, as, as foolish as a monkey. Um, but he also puts this young man um, in the position of the, that's famous to all of us from Rodin's Thinker, which was right outside in, in the hall there. So r at that time, Re Rivera was making reference to that. And then in the background, uh, you, you have Henry Ford's hand making the John the Baptist gesture, and then in the background you have students reading that are made to look as if they're kowtowing to the great hand of, of, of Henry Ford. So a, a lot of, a lot of uh, complexity in, in this. There is Edsel, Edsel Ford. And this is the, the claim that 50,000 Jam Art in Institute to see disputed murals. I think has to be taken with a pinch of salt because we had 60,000 people in the DIA for the first 36 hours that we were open. The DIA is now three times the size that it was in 1927. And it was sometimes frightening to see the crush of people that were in there. But anyway, it was, it was a well, uh, it was a well attended, uh, well attended event. People turned up. Uh, contrary to uh, most of the, the stories, while there was controversy, most people, in fact, were very excited uh, 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 by it. There was the, the newspaper whipped up the battle of the murals. Um, uh, and we now have a very strong indication from oral histories that Edsel Ford himself used his own publicity um, office to stir up a controversy because he was paying the salaries of the individual uh, still on the staff at the DIA in the, in the early 30s. Um, and people were no longer going to the museum. So the theory is that Ford commissioned this to ignite excitement uh, with the DIA again, so that the city would go back to paying the salaries of the staff members. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, uh, Ford was paying something like $230,000 towards salaries in 1933. When this opened, and in 1934, the city of Detroit voted a grant of $440,000 uh, to the uh, So it worked. It, in, in, this, in this case, you can view it as a piece of of propaganda, as some people did, uh, but also looking at a, a piece of, of superb commercial uh, manipulation. And then, of course, in the 1950s, uh, with the House Un-American uh, Committee activities, uh, this is Edgar Richardson, the man who, who succeeded um, uh, uh, William Valentina, and I, I don't know how much of this you can see, but it says there, Rivera's politics and his Publicity seeking are detestable, but let's get the record straight at what he did here. Then he goes on to say this is a, a great work of art celebrating a great uh, world city. And, and that's, of course, what it was. This was very much um, a living, uh, living testimony to what, uh, uh, in the 50s, was once again um, an extraordinarily wealthy um, uh, and prosperous city. How, other at this time, however, other things were going on, and this is a this is a, a, a diagram drawn by Ad Reinhardt uh, for a now defunct um, art, art magazine, where you can see that the tree of modernism, with all of the important things now, he uh, is being dragged down by the weight of the Mexican um, art muralists. So by the 50s, 
it was al already being seen as something of a, 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 a relic, uh, something old-fashioned and rather fusty and having little to do uh, with the modernism that it's the kind of which it seemed to um, praise in the 1930s. Um, sometime they, the, in the museum they took out the, that huge fountain, but they, I don't know if they had sort of if they were nervous, and they put in this little fountain uh, up in, uh, in the corner there, for, which is which is very very strange. You can see it d doesn't really help the mural uh, much at all. Um, the other thing that. Uh, about, about being a, with the murals, not only with the scale and the way that you have a, oh, well, Rothko would have approved the kind of physical relationship that you have with the mural as you move a, around in it. Um, there is extraordinary texture and, and painterliness about seeing this, this particular thing, uh, particular object um, up, up close. Um, this, um, when the mural was opened, uh, first opened, this is one of the few portraits in the mural um, well, there are actually not few. There are a number of murals in the portraits that are of actual people. Um, most of the times, they're models for people in the in the in the mural. In this case, this is an actual portrait, not as is often asserted of Harry Bennett, uh, Ford's enforcer, but of a guy who worked for Harry Bennett called Sorensen. But it, it's a it's an unfavourable rendering of an individual who was responsible for controlling the speed of the of the uh, assembly line, and that that controlled the number of injuries that were going to happen at whatever speed you were moving. Um, in the background, you used to be able to visit, or you can again now, visit the Rouge uh, plant. Here are the bourgeoisie um, looking at um, the, the workers, the noble workers work. They're an extremely unpleasant looking bunch of people, uh, but we do have Dick Tracy back here. We have, we have no face here. We have what I was recently told is an unflattering portrait of the president of Mexico um, at the time. You have the, um, uh, you, you have the, the Cats and Jammer kids with their beanie hats, and you have this sour-looking uh, Catholic lady with an equal, e equally sour-looking individual. All, all of these kinds of things are something that you can notice in a certain quality of reproduction, but you just cannot get um, into it. And I was standing in, in, this, uh, in, in the court last week saying to someone, you know, I've been here for 13 years, and I think I finally look at it and I see a detail, I don't see any details that I haven't seen before. And as I said that, I saw something that I that hadn't really registered before. It's very, for all the clarity of the structure, it's very, very complicated, very, very detailed. Um, and uh, the, when I was asked by some Mexican officials um, how, how I thought that they could reproduce this for an exhibition in Mexico, and I just said, well, you know, there's modern technology, I don't know what it'll cost, but you, you, I suppose you can reproduce it. But, um, so anyway, all of these wonderful details. Here is the assembly line. These are portraits of men who worked with Rivera. There's Halberstadt again. Um, um, uh, but this is the one piece of the, uh, of the mural that is along with the, pr the pressing machine, I suppose. This is completely unrealistic. This is a utopian view of what the assembly line would have looked like. All of the people working on the assembly line at that time would have been white. Um, the, the, the dirty jobs would have gone to the, the, people, uh, the people of color. But this, this is, where is he? I, uh, I don't know, he, he's not in this picture, but Rivera's specialist chemist is in there. But what you also, as you look at, at these, ob these individuals working here, especially this, this group here, when you're standing in front of this thing, you can see that this was the work that Rivera did in a day. This is the day's work, the Italian word for a, a day's work. And when you stand in front of these things, you can, you can see how R R uh, uh, Rivera um, has, has covered it a little bit, but the, ver the very nature of fresco means that the paint has a kind of, a kind of transparency. And you, you get a sense, a strong sense, of the amount of work uh, that Rivera could, could reasonably do um, in a day. And there are, about, there are 30 or so of these particular day-long um, uh, episodes. And you also are able to see this inscription here, where Rivera says that the, the paint, this, this work of art was uh, done at the time of Valentina, was the director, and given uh, to uh, the Art Institute of, of um, D Detroit uh, by Edsel uh, Ford, who was the uh, president of the, of the Arts uh, Commission. So 
other, other details like this. And if you go, if you look at this piece here, in, in, in especially in reproduction, but when, it's not until you get close uh, to, these th to this kind of thing that you can see the kind of painstaking detail with the reflection uh, that Rivera uh, was, was putting um, into, this, into this mural. Some, this, this, is a de this is one of the details that I only really looked at uh, very, very, very recently. And I thought I'd throw in, this is a little bit misleading, I'd th sort of throw in a couple of reproductions from the DIA's own uh, resources. This is the, this is the fold out that you get if you buy Linda Down's book um, on Rivera that, that gives you the impression of what, uh, of what one of the walls looks like. And, and this is, um, this is, is from a, a postcard that we sell um, in, the, in the museum shop. And I asked the, uh, our wonderfully skillful photographers to be as true as they could uh, to, um, uh, to this, but these look much more, the color of these two things look much more similar than they actually, uh, than they actually are. And again, return to the, it, it, it's obviously a slam dunk in a way to say that you can't avoid an object like this if you're talking about experiencing the thing as, a, as opposed to reproduction. But uh, I, I use this slide to, to I hope to demonstrate that there is no way that you even come remotely close uh, to conveying the strength and the power um, that, that this work uh, can, can convey when you, when you step into it. More often than not, when I take a guest into this room, they gasp audibly, just can't, can't help themselves. And so that, that, is our, that is our big, that's our big Mona Lisa, that's the work of art um, uh, that, that we're known for, that people come uh, uh, to look for. And it is, it is something that you have to see. You, you cannot ex experience it. Rivera proclaimed that it was most, his most successful mural. And most of my Mexican colleagues uh, agree that this is, even though it's not in Mexico, this, this, was, this was the best one. But I'm uh, finishing with um, some slides uh, that, that in a way may also state the obvious uh, of uh, an object like this, Bernini's uh, Modelo for the throne of St. Peter's, uh, uh, currently on its way to an exhibition at the Met. Um, th these are two s slides of the same object from, taken from just about the same uh, angle. When for, for deliberate reasons, the photographers chose to make them look like this for, that, for their particular uh, publication. Uh, you get a sense in this photograph of the scraping and the, and the carving that you, you, you see much more forcefully if the vitrine is open and, and you, can, you can look at the back. Um, but this, this is about as close to the original that, that, that I found. But uh, and there's another one. So you, you, you get those, you, you get to convey what it looks like. And of course, you can do holograms that make it turn around. But the actual physicality that you see in a work like this, uh, which is, uh, ac accompanies the throne, um, if, you get, if you're lucky enough to get close enough and see beyond the scrapings, and you can see this with the naked eye in front of these, you see what is almost certainly Bernini's fingerprints. Um, on the uh, um, on, on the work uh, to that uh, to that scale, I couldn't find a slide that corresponded uh, with uh, with that one. Here's uh, three examples of our Van Gogh. Um, this it taken in the 80s, this taken in the 90s, and this taken in the last um, decade. And this one, uh, the palest in a way of them, is the one that is, is closer. Uh, to, the, uh, to the original. When these kinds of, uh, obviously technology improves in, all the time, and this kind of reproduction um, uh, it gets, gets closer all the time, as we can see from this progression. But photographers are still in the business of, of taking a painting like a Van Gogh and then putting the camera on it. And because it's not a flat surface, they get all of these reflections, bounce, light bouncing around. So the first thing they have to do is to polarize the whole thing, shut it down, sometimes double polarize it, and then take the picture so they don't have all the light bouncing around, and then go back in and, and work with it. And depending on the technology, uh, with the old, um, this, the, in the 80s, uh, this, this was considered uh, close. Um, this, this, to the photographer who made this print and to the person who accepted it, at the time, 
was the best they could do to come close to what the original was. We come, as I say, we come much, much, much closer now with all this digital, uh, digital te technology and the incredible focus that we're um, uh, that we're capable of. But when planning uh, this lecture and, and, and burdening my colleague, the photographers, with requests for pictures, they they said that basically in their business they don't talk about reproductions; they talk about representations because whatever they do, they can only represent an aspect or two of the work of art uh, that they are uh, that they are looking at um, here is uh, one of our Modigliani's um, it's not uh, as clear as it is in but up here there's a little bit of the weave showing through and when this piece was um, on view as part of our Inside Out uh, program where we've been putting reproductions of works up around. I was um, at uh, one of those sites and looked at this and looking more closely at it, um, I saw this component here and it was, it was, uh, it was odd, it was like a double take. It was, it was such a superb photograph that it was obviously, that it was obvious that this was a two, three dimensional object made on weave that made you think, made me think, I need to go back and look at that at the museum again because th that was a good representation of, of what the original work of art uh, um, um, conveys, but that's all, that's all it, it, it is. And here is a, the, the, the painting. Um, uh, as, as seen flat on in a polarized version and, and, and tampered with version. This is from our conservation laboratory where it's been photographed in, uh, in raking light. And you can see the kind of thing that the photographers are talking about when they say they, they have, first of all, they have to deal with is the real light bouncing around on what is effectively a three-dimensional three object. And I'll close with an example that both, I hope, reinforces what I was saying, but also stresses the fact that we are getting very, very good at representation. Uh, we uh, recently borrowed for a month uh, the Vermeer, a woman with a, holding a balance from, from the National Gallery, and we decided uh, to show it um, alongside um, our De Hoog and our Tabor. Um, it was a cruel thing to do to these two artists because it, to our way of thinking about what a good painting is, uh, the, the De Hoog looked much more like the 19th century simpering sentimental uh, picture um, that, uh, that it, it, it became. Uh, the Vermeer, uh, it was clear, was, um, uh, is why we value it today, an object that is about paint. It is about, uh, it is about three, three dimensions. And the Tabor was all about being very, very clever at being able to manipulate surfaces to create simulations of things like, uh, things like uh, satin. Um, but by way of our, uh, of our uh, preferences today, it's, Vermeer is, is the one, it, it is the artist who, who really matters. The, the, the fact that he was literally written out of the history books um, in the 18th and early 19th centuries and had to be put back together again uh, by scholars. Our Tabork was, I th may have been attributed to Ochterveld, I'm not sure, but another, another artist. And I put the three together, and I, I, I hope it sort of makes the point that uh, while on the one hand uh, these paintings, the, 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 the technology today enables us to get a sense of what the, the differences uh, may be, as I think is the case with um, since we've had uh, color photography that makes us want to look more at the painting than we did before. It wasn't a deterrent to going to the museum. Uh, so I feel quite confident that the growing technology in terms of re reproducing works of art will be able to highlight the kinds of things that make us want to see the original um, object um, uh, as well. Um, the other aspects of being able to use um, not need, using virtual um, methods and, and having technology. I think if you've been to the DIA, you've seen that we're, we're trying to be experimental uh, with this kind of thing and trying to use all of these various uh, technologies to enhance uh, the experience of actually visually groping with the, with the object in front of you. And I'll close just by reinforcing that every single label a descriptive label, every single um, uh, interactive, uh, the, the final test is does this, uh, does this device 
make the viewer want to look back at the work of art again, rather than taking the information and w walking away. And we now that we have the, we're finally getting in the findings. We it does seem to be working overall. Um, ironically. The one that people seem to be more satisfied with, with anything else, is the one that's become the kind of the icon of our reinstallation. When people have sat through the dining table for five minutes, they tend not to go back and look at the, uh, look, look at the objects. So we've given them a virtual experience. I don't know what we're going to do about it. Um, and it, it satisfied them to the extent that the objects that we thought they would then stand up and just go and look at the pan over there and go and look at the candlesticks over there, it, it actually isn't, isn't working that way. But everybody loves the dining table. Thank you very much. spent significant time in the Re Rivera Court uh, was in 2008 with the Museum Studies cohort and at that time you had some um, interactive consoles that visitors could rent or borrow and sort of um, use a touch screen to explore aspects of the mural in more detail. I wonder if you can talk more about the history of interpreting that mural for visitors who maybe don't want to do a guided tour, um, if whether that was successful and what's there now. Um, yeah, yes, it, it's a handheld uh, device, and it, originally it was a, it was just about like a BlackBerry, um, and you 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 know you, you pick how you want to enter the work of art, and you pick one of four stories. In, in this case, one about the making of the mural, one about Rivera himself, one about uh, being a worker on the assembly line. I, I forget what the what the fourth one is about. There are other points of information too, but you can you can pick how you want to start interpreting uh, this uh, th this complicated thing uh, that's around you. Our, our the evidence the evidence coming back in that it's very very successful, but its real success only came when we when we came upon its third iteration of technology. We had first of all we had the BlackBerry type thing, then we had a slightly bigger one, and it, but. By the third year, we were already using the iPad. And so that's, you know, that's how fast this kind of thing is moving. I'm happy to say that the iPad seems to work fantastically well. And it's now in its second or third year, second year. And we're not looking to making any changes. That's another challenge of, of, of technology. When people get used to looking to an iPad, this, this ceases to be uh, any, anything other than a frustration. And I'm, I'm obviously old fashioned to have, you still have one of those. So. Thank you for the lecture. Um, I, have, I have a question about the commission, because you said that he was in Detroit in April of, of 30, 32. 32. And so um, in some of the literature about the, the commissioning of the painting, it's, there is a discussion of the um, hunger strike that happened on the 7th of March of the same year when Henry Ford or some, you know, um, worker at the Rouge plant ordered for the police to fire on the strike, on the, on the hunger strike. And I know there's one story that Diego Rivera was told by Edsel Ford that that was actually a pro-labor parade. And then, but then there's a sort of obscurity about, did he find out that that happened? What's the sort of back backstory in relation to his discovery, or did he ever know that that had happened? And um, I, I've heard a few different versions. I wonder if you would share yours. Um, well, as we all know, Rivera got kicked out of the Communist Party twice. Um, he was an extremely unorthodox, idiosyncratic uh, communist, and certainly a man who came to the US regularly and painted flattering portraits of society people, which is where he earned all his money, had an ambivalent relationship to classical uh, communism. And the, the material that, that, that I've come across would, would indicate that Rivera really wasn't interested in, in that kind of activity. He was first and foremost, he, was, he had his philosophical beliefs, but first and foremost, he was, uh, he was an artist. And Linda Downs, um, in, her, in her book, in a much more um, decorous way, seems to indicate that Rivera got out of town as quickly as he could when those, uh, when, when those particular activities started. But he was finished. He was done. It was just a week before. Graham, I have a question. 
Um, uh, I'm, I'd like to see if we can bring the talk back to the nature of the series uh, that's intended to examine the nature of the object. I'm interested in your use of the term representations uh, when you're talking about uh, what others would call reproductions of works of art in the collection. I'm wondering from your perspective as a museum director, if you can talk a little bit about those qualities of original uh, of artifacts in their original state um, that can be captured in a reproduction, and those qualities that are that might be utterly lacking in a reproduction. Um, well, I think um, using the word representation um, as a reproduction, I, to me, um, implies something that successfully reproduces something. That it, it is, if not necessarily a replica, but it's you know a child or, or something. You know, it, it has its own validity, uh, whatever it, it, it exists in in that. Is complementary in that university. When, when you're looking, f as many of you know, I'm sure from having uh, worked on, on producing books, you you start you have to make decisions about what you want to be brought to the fore um, in whatever it is that you're working with, publishing or or, or or reproducing, because you're not going to be able to capture even even in a so-called two-dimensional two object. Uh, you, you're not going to be able to capture all of those qualities that I I exist to the naked eye. Um, now, I, 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 I was reading a number of years ago about um, the British government, uh, the, the British Museum, uh, different from the British government, was thinking of, um, offer, was offered the Greeks a, a, an incredibly expensive um, Reproduction of the Elgin marbles made by a laser technology of phenomenal expense, but I presume it has something to do with these three-dimensional printers that we have now, uh, where the detail would be so um, good, so so accurate that the human eye wouldn't be able to s differentiate between the, uh, the the Elgin original and and the and the reproduction. Um, and of course, the Greeks' answer was pretty obvious: that well, you keep the reproduction, and we'll, we'll take the original. So the story, so the story goes. But absent that kind of instance, um, you, you, you're as the Van Gogh picture show. I think you, you, you're making decisions as to what kind of representation you want of that work of art that will reinforce whatever idea it is that you're you're trying to get across. And that, that's the best that we can do these days. I could just add a, a comment. Uh, I think one of the things that, that um, entrances me anyway, and I think many museum visitors about original objects, is that there are objects that have history. And so, I mean, this is one thing you, you can talk about, just the, the, the purely visual properties of an object. It has a very different history from the, the kind of history that you've just laid out for these, uh, for these murals. Um, and I think that should be remain a part of these conversations. I don't know if you had a, a thought about that, but the history of objects. Um, yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, probably the ownership, what it's what it's gone through. There's there's that um, famous jab at Lord Clark that I think John Berger, Berger made in his series, where he shows uh, he says this is a painting by Van Gogh, and it's crows in a wheat field, and he said, this is the painting that Van Gogh was painting when he shot himself. And what does, what does that do uh, to that, that object? So yeah, the, oh, yeah well, that, as for all sorts of reasons, the, the history of the ownership is something that, I mean, it, romanticism are other things, that, but just the thought that these objects have existed through, and in your case, so, so much time um, before ending up in this uh, Rather strange position as being valued for its uh, primarily for its visual qualities, and I mean that again. That is just that is something that we've tried to build into aspects of, of the reinstallation. The whole question of the, the the history of an object that was made for a Russian uh, Tsarina that was sold by Stalin that was bought by a wealthy American woman who then left it to the museum, that the sense that this went through these different lives, um, different identities, and uh, different reasons for, for being around. Everything from decorating a, a, a house in Gross Point to financing the five-year plan of Stalin. Yeah. Thank you very much.